In my last video, I discussed some extreme historical examples of state regimes censoring art both on the far right and the far left of the political spectrum. I also discussed how McCarthyism and the Hollywood blacklist showed us how even in democratic societies, senates and state departments can be utilized in climates of fear to censor people and strip them of their constitutional rights. Times of political turmoil and widespread distrust of government and its institutions are the perfect breeding grounds either for dictatorial regimes or mob mentality taking over democratic institutions and censoring on their behalf, which is why I think it's important to talk about the present culture war and the forms of censorship we see people engaging in today, and why our current climate is both anti-creative and anti-art. Even outside of dictatorships and witch hunts, free speech in the arts is something that's always under threat and always needs fighting for. Because we live in a pluralistic society, there will always be warring factions of people trying to censor art based on their own personal, political, and moral values. While the Hollywood blacklist ended in the 1960s alongside the fall of McCarthyism and there was more freedom in the movie business, society turned towards censoring comedians as its new means of cultural control. Between 1961 and 1965, comedian Lenny Bruce was arrested on grounds of obscenity multiple times, was sentenced to four months in jail, and was subsequently blacklisted in nightclubs across the country despite his popularity so they wouldn't get in legal trouble. He died shortly after. Inspired by Lenny Bruce and the unclear regulations surrounding indecent and obscene language, George George Carlin would go on to create his famous seven words you can never say on television bit, which he would later get arrested for in Milwaukee in 1972. George Carlin's bit eventually made it to the Supreme Court when a parent complained about hearing it on the radio with his children, and the court narrowly ruled in the FCC's favor and allowed them to censor content they found to be indecent and set parameters on when it could be broadcast. Because the FCC controlled the vast majority of media at the time, this was an even bigger deal then than it would be today. Fast forwarding to the late 1980s, the FCC began receiving large amounts of complaints from Christian organizations and parents due to the suggestive nature of The Howard Stern Show, launching an investigation that concluded in the FCC expanding their definition of indecency beyond the seven dirty words to quote, language or material that depicts or describes, in terms patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium, sexual or excretory activities or organs. As a result, between 1990 and 2004, the FCC issued $2.5 million in fines to radio licensees for airing indecent material from The Howard Stern Show. In the early 2000s, however, an extremely important invention hit the United States that fundamentally changed the scope that the FCC had in terms of censoring broadcasting, and that was satellite radio, which due to its nature as a subscription-based service, wasn't under threat or control of the FCC. And after facing constant fines and legal fees for his show, Howard Stern accepted a $500 million five-year contract to move to satellite radio in January of 2006. It's impossible to overstate how much of a phenomenon this guy was, whether you love him or hate him. He was ubiquitous, he was everywhere, and he actually did a lot for free speech in the arts. And while I'm sure his huge paycheck to switch over to satellite radio helped, I really do appreciate that he stated that the move was not because of the money, but for free speech instead, stating, This is a free speech issue. I represent everything they can't do on regular radio. Corporate radio, the FCC, and the religious right are taking away our free speech, and it's time for a change. That's why satellite radio will succeed. And I'm going to be discussing shock art and its censorship more thoroughly in the next video because that will be the theme, but the reason I bring up Howard Stern and satellite radio is because I feel like this was really the beginning of the sort of subscription-based service you know, module that we see today in terms of all forms of entertainment. I think these sorts of inventions and then the ubiquity of the internet has completely changed how we create and consume art, and it's kind of rendered traditional media forms like the television and old school radio obsolete. And in a previous video, I raised the question of how come for so long it's mostly been conservatives trying to censor new art forms, particularly the shock jock and shock art era, and back in the day McCarthyism, whereas today it seems to be left-wing 20-year-old girls on the internet who are trying to cancel and censor everything and have all art conform to their moral authority. I feel like I'm starting to gather a theory as to why, and I think of course it has to do with social media. I feel like conservatives, of course, have always gone to lawmakers to express their concerns and trying to get things restricted by law and get parental advisory stickers and all of this and try to suppress art in that sense. But when it comes to left-wing censorship, they tend to do it through bureaucracies and corporations, which makes sense because corporations care a lot about the sort of progressive Gen Z and millennial demographic because they have a lot more disposable income because they have their parents' disposable income. And so they capitulate to these demands and they put, you know, pride flags all over their Instagram during Pride Month even though they have nothing to do with 
gay rights. It's like chocolate bar companies and so on. I think this is also why platforms like Netflix will remove TV shows that they think they'll get canceled for before anyone's even raised any complaints. And I also think the invention of social media has provided just a landscape where all of these echo chambers could go on where these woke progressives could get more and more extreme with each other in their communities and then go out and attack companies and corporations and pieces of art and literature and music and so on. And because canceling at its very beginning had such a huge effect on everyone and everything, and it still kind of does, all these corporations just kind of bent down to the demands and just have been going on with whatever these people are saying. And when it comes to who has more power over our culture, the law and government or corporations, it's really a toss up. And in that sense, I honestly have to respect the strategy of the far left and the woke forms of the left right now because they really have figured out a way to gain cultural dominance and try to assert their authority and their politics in a way that's truly been working. I mean, look at the climate that we're in, the climate of fear and self-censorship. Like, they're really doing what they wanted to. My praise for the far left ends there, of course, though, because I view their calls for censorship as just as insane and ridiculous and threatening as fundamentalist Christians calling for things like Harry Potter to be seen as demonic and trying to cancel anything that they view as satanic and so on. It's literally just the same flavor on the other side of the coin. But as stated in the first video of this series, censorship is seen all across the political spectrum. It's enacted by people who want to impose a rigid structure on society rather than let culture emerge organically through the free exchange of ideas. Limiting freedom of speech and expression is always an authoritarian move. It doesn't matter what your motives are or who you are as an individual. And now that we understand that artistic freedom is something that always needs fighting for, let's take a longer look at the mob mentalities we're seeing popping up today from social media and how they are fostering a climate of cancel culture and self censorship and how this is negatively impacting artistic expression. And with that, I'm going to talk about the elimination of risk in comedy, plus defending Dave Chappelle. All art making, but particularly transgressive art making, requires taking creative risks. When you put something out into the world, you have no idea how people will respond or if they'll think it's good or not. When it comes to the process of simply becoming an artist, it requires that you continually fail and embarrass yourself over and over and over again publicly. And when it comes to creative risk-taking and towing the line, the art form that does this most directly is stand-up comedy. The beauty of jokes and comedy is the risk. It's someone risking embarrassing and humiliating themselves in hopes that other people laugh, which is a huge social reward. I imagine one of the worst feelings in the world is being booed off of a stage when you're trying to make an audience laugh. And I also imagine that there is no better feeling in the world than being a stand-up comic and having an entire arena just erupt in laughter and like be unable to control themselves. Like it seems like, I feel like that would probably be the best feeling that a human could experience. But now it seems like comedians are publicly shamed for every joke that they tell ever. And it also seems like people don't understand how stand-up comedy works. Like they don't understand that these comedians go city to city, place to place, like practicing their set, taking what works, what doesn't, based on audience reaction. Everything is crafted with the audience physically until they have a good enough set that they could actually put it on Netflix if they're big enough that Netflix is buying their specials and so on. And so when journalists hide in comedy clubs with little microphones attached to themselves to shame comedians making any sort of edgy jokes, regardless of whether they're funny or not, to try and cancel or shame them, they're signaling to artists everywhere that trying things out and failing isn't worth it because a widespread mob campaign might come after you. The risk to reward ratio for a lot of people is totally screwed. And while the right has long made baseless claims blaming heavy metal artists for school shootings and as a way to enact censorship, which I'll talk about in my next video, we see identity politics activists making baseless claims that making transgender jokes directly impacts violence and against trans individuals, as if anyone's ever gotten angry and riled up at a Dave Chappelle show and gone out and beat up every androgynous person they see on the street. When people are using censorship as a means for authoritarian control, they make these baseless claims that are extremely extreme, so that way it pulls on people's heartstrings and gets action going. If you can blame a school shooting on Marilyn Manson and his music, then you don't have to do anything about the whole gun control debate or anything like that. It's a scapegoat. But I like how the people who stormed all of these Netflix meetings and called for Dave's special to be canceled completely missed the point of his special, which was about empathizing with people who you can't understand. The last 10 minutes of his special is him detailing how the woke mob went after his trans friend when she stood up for him and how she committed suicide six days later and that he explicitly says he'll stop making trans jokes if trans activists stop mobbing around comedians. 
As he says, empathy isn't gay, it's bisexual, it goes both ways. But to me, the worst part of this whole debacle was how clear it was that all of these people trying to cancel him have never stepped foot inside of a comedy club, like literally any comedy club in any city in America, because all the jokes you'll hear there are way more offensive and edgy than anything Dave Chappelle said in his special. Everyone is fair game when it comes to comedy. Comedians joke about every race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. They make fun of individuals in the crowd at the show. I remember going to a comedy club very shortly after people were trying to cancel Dave Chappelle, which was great because all these comedians were coming out and like they were coming out strong, man. Like they were defending their craft. But there were multiple comedians who came out and when they figured out the people in the front row were father and son, made endless incest jokes about them. Like that's just how it is in the world of comedy. Like, I'm sorry that this isn't the art form for you, but why are you trying to cancel it for other people? Like, this is just not for you. People who appreciate stand-up comedy understand that nobody is safe, and trying to treat certain groups as being so important that they can't be criticized or made fun of is literally the opposite of equality. I also just find it so annoying that people are always trying to censor artworks that they haven't even seen or consumed. They're just going off of what other people around them say. It's so annoying. And this honestly wouldn't be such a big deal if it wasn't so often that people capitulated to these petty demands. Thankfully in this case, although all of the film festivals dropped Dave Chappelle's documentary and everything and he got cancelled in that sense, thankfully the head guy of Netflix took a stand against it. I'm assuming because he made so much money and spent so much money on the special. It always comes down to money, people. I don't know what to tell you. At least this time, the mob didn't win, even though they literally, like, encroached upon the meetings and everything. And hopefully this will be some sort of turning point in terms of the culture war. But the thing is, for me, it's like, yes, everyone has the right to protest, to express their offense, to boycott things, to be offended. Yes, you have the right for all of these things. I just personally can't imagine being so entitled that you think because you find something offensive or you don't like it, Everyone else has to bend to your will. No one else gets to enjoy anything that you don't like. Like, it just, it's something that I truly can't wrap my head around, and I'm a pretty self-absorbed person. But I just had to get that rant out there. I know he was canceled so long ago, but you guys already know how I feel about stand-up comedy. Been talking about it for like two years now. But with that, I think I'll turn gears to censorship in the literary world with the rise of sensitivity readers. Sensitivity readers and the dumbing down of the arts. While censorship imposed from governments is always the most concerning threat to free speech, self-censorship resulting from a rigid cultural climate is a close second. One way we see the infiltration of widespread mob mentality from social media affecting individual artists and the publishing houses they rely on is in the world of young adult fiction. As increasingly strict standards have emerged about who and what people of certain races and genders are allowed to write about, the market for sensitivity readers has boomed. Sensitivity readers are for hire beta readers who sell themselves on their identity status to advocate for changes in stories on the grounds of spotting cultural inaccuracies, bias, stereotypes, and problematic language. And as you might imagine, the rise of sensitivity readers is a polarizing issue in today's climate, as everything is, and to quote from The Spectator, Zoe Dubno writes, for critics, these individuals are the latest stage of the culture wars, wokeifying new books before readers even have the chance to read them. For publishers, they offer a seductively cheap way of reducing the risk of a book or its author being cancelled and the ensuing reputational and profit damage to the firm. And I've responded in a previous video to the sort of social media criticism that we see online where everything's problematic and where, for instance, women are only allowed to write female characters, they can't write male characters, but conversely or paradoxically, if you're white, you have to write people of other races than you, otherwise you're racist. But also if you do, like, you're imposing your own white structure on their lived experience. Like, it's very complicated, and the fact that everything's problematic kind of leaves us all in a no-win scenario. But outside of social media, Zoe mentions in her article a conversation she has with a friend of how this sort of mentality has reached publishing houses, stating, An editor recently said, in complete earnest, she thinks it's offensive for men to write female characters because they don't have the experience of being female. I gasped, not because what the editor had said was shocking, but because it was a perfect crystallization of this obsession with depicting reality and lived experience pushed to its logical conclusion. Are novels meant to be a perfect reflection of reality, or do they communicate to the reader the thoughts and beliefs of the writer or the society he lives in, including the sick, twisted, uncomfortable thoughts? 
And to me, while fiction writing can technically stand alone, I think most art is a reflection of the time period. It can be both a reflection of reality and a dramatization of reality. But when it comes to the feeling of a time period, I think art gives us the most visceral reaction or feeling we can have when it comes to it. And censoring art or sanitizing it is number one, sometimes historical revisionism, but more importantly, cuts off that piece of history. When all fiction or comedy has to fit a strict ideological norm and everything else is censored, we really can't get a grasp of what people were thinking or feeling in a given time period. It's all artificial and very confined. But getting back into the publishing world, a specific example of this mentality affecting art is outlined in a recent Reason article, where Kat Rosenfield details the story of a young Filipino writer who wrote a fictional novel about a black student's experience in an all-white school. His agent was over the moon with his writing, but the night before sending out submissions told the man to emphasize his racial identity, which the agent thought was black. When he found out that the writer wasn't black, he immediately told him to make changes to his manuscript and hire sensitivity readers. The author describes his agent as frightened due to the current political and artistic climate, and ultimately the author decided to self-publish the book under a pseudonym rather than censor his writing. Basically, the agent just kept asking for more and more changes, particularly when it came to racial identity and so on, so that way the book wouldn't overall get cancelled and the reputation wouldn't be harmed, but thankfully some people still have integrity, and while it's sad that he published it under a pseudonym, at least the work still exists in the world. But what's funny too is that the sensitivity reader that they made him hire to suggest changes to his books was a British black woman who had never lived in America or gone to an American university. But of course, because everyone of a certain race or gender is a monolith, she has the authority to act on and to know and describe the experience of a black man going to an all-white American university. Like, there's no way for her to know that, but by virtue of the color of the skin, apparently she has more authority than the writer, who was actually like a first-generation college student, but doesn't matter. And the writer of this article goes on to describe her experience being a sensitivity reader for her friend, who was a male writing a female character, and she states, At the time, I felt the fundamental tension, even absurdity, inherent to what I was doing, suggesting edits that would take all the teeth out of the story, all for the sake of placating the type of person who would invariably just find something else to be offended by. And I think this quote really encapsulates what happens when you try to create art that won't offend the most sensitive and extreme readers, which is that they'll just find something else to be offended by. In March of 2022, the author Sandra Newman posted a cover reveal and plot synopsis of her new book, The Men, on Twitter. The book utilized the premise of gender side, where all the men disappear from the planet, leaving behind only individuals with X chromosomes. But there was something Newman had failed to account for. It's offensive in certain circles to suggest that everybody with an XY chromosome is in fact a man. Cue the Twitter mob. Many assumed that Newman had skipped a sensitivity read. They started saying like, what about trans people? What about trans people in this book? Did you have a trans sensitivity reader? Author says, I did have a trans sensitivity reader. And then the response to that was, what, only one? Do you think that's an excuse? Like, this is even worse. It means you knowingly did this. When it comes to cancel culture, the goalposts are always being moved. If there's one thing we have learned in the last 10 years, it should be that. And that's why when people cater to these sorts of people, their work just becomes more and more absurd over time alongside our culture becoming more and more absurd. But the author of that article also penned a long read in Vulture five years ago. That's how I came across this whole phenomenon. It's actually because a subscriber recommended this article in my comment section on one of my previous videos, which as a side note, I feel like I have the best subscribers on this platform. Like I see comment sections on like even large YouTubers videos, it's not really like you guys. Like, you guys, you ref you give so many good references and you recommend all these great books and articles and movies, and all of your responses are always so thoughtful. Like, I'm just very impressed with the quality of people who have found this channel, and so I just want to thank you guys. But anyways, the article that this subscriber recommended talks about sensitivity readers as well as a book being canceled before it was published, and overall how cancel culture is affecting young adult novels. She writes, The Black Witch centers on a girl named Ellerin who has been raised in a stratified society where other races are considered inferior at best and enemies at worst. But when she goes off to college, she begins to question her beliefs, an ideological transformation she's still working on when she joins the rebellion in the last of the novel's 600 pages. It was this premise that led Sinyard, who was the blogger leading a mob campaign, to slam the Black Witch as racist, ableist, homophobic, and written with no marginalized people in mind, in a review that consisted largely of pull quotes featuring the book's racist characters saying or doing racist things. Here's a representative excerpt, an offending sentence juxtaposed with Sinyard's commentary. Page 163. The Celts are not a pure race like us. 
They're more accepting of intermarriage, and because of this, they're hopelessly mixed. And then Sinyard's commentary. Yes, you just read that with your own two eyes. This is one of the times my jaw dropped in horror and I had to walk away from this book. The publisher was bombarded with emails pressuring her not to publish the book. The mob was utilized to tank the score on Goodreads down to 1.7, even though the people commenting hadn't read the book. Whereas on Amazon after the book came out, it received a 4.3 rating. And what is so hilarious about this is that while the book was being canceled for being racist, on Amazon, the biggest criticism of the book that were by normal people, not part of this Twitter mob, was that the book was way too woke and like pushing its pro-diversity, anti-racism message too far. And that honestly just goes to show, number one, how extreme certain groups are, but number two, like how polarized this world is. It's absolutely insane. Like people live in separate realities and people naturally kind of create what they create based on what's going on around them and the voices that they're hearing. And if you care about impressing an audience, it's very difficult not to hear the loudest, screechiest voices or the most easily offended and to try to cater to them. But overall, no one really has a good grasp on public opinion because of how polarized things are and because of all the different echo chambers that people find themselves in. But this article also has one of my favorite quotes I've read ever stating, a growing number of critics say the draggings, well-intended though they may be, are evidence of a growing dysfunction in the world of YA publishing. One author and former diversity advocate described why she no longer takes part. I have never seen social interaction this fucked up, she wrote in an email and I've been in prison. <laughs> and I just love that. I think that's hilarious, but dude, don't be on Twitter. Twitter is bad. <laughs> and while most books go on to get published regardless of the backlash, as they should, there have been examples of books being pulled from shelves or authors deciding against publishing their books after they have been preemptively canceled. And basically, the sort of cancel culture mob mentality that we're seeing a lot online and in terms of activist protesters, it's really spilling over from a small group of people into the dominant culture, and it really is fostering a climate of self-censorship or people, you know, changing their artwork in hopes that it won't be canceled. And so while a lot of people like to claim that like cancel culture isn't real and this isn't really that big of a deal, it's like it is having an actual effect on the world. Like people are self-censoring and changing and our art is getting worse because of it. I don't personally read young adult fiction novels, so I can't tell you how much the genre has changed or how closely to an ideology every book fits within that genre, but there is definitely an entire kind of war going on over there in terms of how people feel about certain books and what kind of books are profitable and marketable or not. And it also sounds like this culture and fear of cancellation is really affecting publishers and editors as well. And this is just, I think, really having an effect on what people produce. But moving on, I do want to talk about, you know, the sort of idea that everything has to be a literal representation and people of certain races can only write their own race and everyone can only write about their own experiences and so on. I want to talk about that in terms of Hollywood and how this is kind of killing our suspension of disbelief when it comes to fictional characters and so on. Identity politics and the suspension of disbelief. When we are watching or reading a work of fiction, we enter a space where the fiction plays out as true for the duration of our enjoyment, even though we logically know that the plot and characters are made up. This is called the suspension of disbelief. In today's political climate, however, people are pushed into thinking works of fiction are literal and that actors need to represent their real identities rather than embody different characters. By actively encouraging the elimination of suspension of disbelief, we are narrowing the creative landscape and reducing the opportunity for people to empathize with characters outside of themselves. So an idea that's gained a lot of popularity and credence over the past decade is the idea that you can't separate the art from the artist. And sometimes this idea is used when it comes to like crime, like artists who have committed crime, you can't enjoy their art as a result, it's wrong or something. I'm not talking about that sense here, but I am talking about the idea that people can only write about their own experience or people of their identity group, and that straight actors can't play gay characters or cisgender people can't play transgender people and so on in movies, even though the job of an actor is to be a character who is not yourself, it's to embody someone else's persona. So like, why should it matter what the actor's identity is? And I think that this insistence on making art literal and representative of the real world is kind of a mistake. Like if that happens sometimes, that's fine. But just because someone's playing a character that's different from who they are, I don't get how that makes it problematic. I mean, I understand sometimes it doesn't make sense for a story. Like if your story is about like growing up as a poor black woman in the deep south during segregation era, and then you hire like someone who looks like me to play the lead role, like that wouldn't make sense, I get it. But in other ways, like, I remember watching Boys Don't Cry when I was in high school and it completely devastated me. Oh my God. That, it was an experience watching that movie. But yeah, Hilary Swank plays a transgender character and she's not transgender, but it doesn't matter because it's a movie. And like, 
not having that movie be made or having her performance, which was a brilliant performance, be on screen would have prevented me and tons of other people from empathizing with the transgender character and his struggles, which back in the day before, you know, Caitlyn Jenner and the whole culture war explosion, people didn't really know that much about transgender people. Like that was kind of my first introduction to the whole thing. And it really opened my eyes to like this actual experience that was based on a real life story. But to throw that out just because the character or the actor playing the character isn't transgender herself, that would be so idiotic and ridiculous. And recently I watched Denzel Washington play Macbeth, back when that was in the theaters, and that was fine. I wasn't like offended that a black man is playing a Scottish character, like even though it doesn't make sense in the story, like it just doesn't matter. Like you should be able to see past that kind of thing when you're watching a work of fiction. But restricting the kind of characters people could play or the kind of characters they're allowed to write based on their real world identity, I think is a huge mistake. I think if something is bad, if the artwork is bad, people simply aren't going to like it or watch it or whatever or give it any sort of respect. And so if you write a really bad depiction of some kind of identity, it's probably going to die out anyway. It's probably not going to be celebrated as good art. But when it's done well and the story or the character has traits that are universal, people will be able to empathize with the character regardless of what they look like or what gender they are and so on. And it's also like there's no more art for art's sake anymore, like it all has to be political and again, it all has to be grounded in current progressive politics, and I just think it's really impoverishing the creative landscape. And unfortunately, these sort of demands have hit Hollywood, and the whole cancel culture thing has hit Hollywood. A lot of directors and writers and producers feel like they have to conform to these strict ideological confines out of fear, and actors and writers are sometimes dropped from projects for decade-old tweets. I think this politics is also why we are just constantly getting trashy reboots of old TV shows with diverse characters, but it's like totally tokenization and it's not good and it's not edgy at all and everything's super sanitized. I think it's because of this fear within the industry and of course it's all about PR. And personally also, not to get conspiratorial, but I do think that this recent emphasis on progressive politics and so on and catering to the most outraged within Hollywood is kind of just a response after it. people figured out that they've been covering up Harvey Weinstein for more than a decade and so they want to seem like good people when they're obviously not. Whatever. Point is, these big corporations such as Disney, at least when they're showing films in the United States, feel like they have to cater to these sorts of woke people and identity politics people when it comes to making the movies that they make. And also, not just in the art world, but nationwide, people fear losing employment because of their political beliefs or facing economic repercussions. And when it comes to a group as insular as Hollywood, I think it's very easy for certain ideological beliefs to become homogenized faster than it would be in the greater population because it is such a small group of people. Kind of like how all of the celebrities are Scientologists, it's like, how come it's only celebrities who convert to like this niche religion? Like, I don't really get it, but I guess because they all hang out with each other, so they just proselytize all the time. Anyways, point is, Hollywood is very ideologically strict. You don't need me to tell you that. It's very obvious at this point, but this is having an effect on the kind of art that is available for people to consume. I've complained before about how we don't have comedies anymore, like there's no more comedy movies. And part of it is the commodification that I talk about in my other video, but also a lot of it is having to cater to this sort of politics and the sort of cancel culture and so on, which is really annoying because you'd think an institution as large as Hollywood wouldn't really care what people online say. But again, it's all PR. But anyways, to conclude, I think it's really important to talk about the culture war because we do see advocation for censorship coming from all across the political spectrum and people truly want dominance over democracy and given the state of the country right now, I feel like we're exiting the democracy stage pretty fast. I know people have been saying that for a long time, but it's like, we also recently had an insurrection to try to stop a free and fair election. Like, like the end signs, the end symptoms of democracy are here. It's really just a question of who's going to win or who's going to take over, or what kind of group will. But I guarantee you, whichever group it is, is immediately going to try and censor whatever they can that they don't approve with, particularly during the rise to power and like stabilizing phase. So it's just good to keep an eye out on these kinds of things, I think. And I think it's really important. I know it's easier said than done, but like, People need to make art regardless of what other people say. They need to make art regardless of the fear of getting canceled. Like, people need to speak their minds. Like, the more people stay quiet, the less likely we are to actually, like, recover from this or get through or prevent it. Honestly, it feels weird telling people that they need to, like, speak their minds more when it's, like, we're hearing so many people's voices all the time and it's too much and it's unnatural. But it's expressing opinions and encouraging debate and having real representation that are some of the fundamental blocks and privileges of democracy, as well as how we keep it going. But anyway, that's my video. I'm sorry if this one was unorganized. 
I'm literally moving across the country tomorrow, so that by the time this series goes up, I'll already be across the country, but yeah. Every time I make a video, I don't know what's wrong with me, why I haven't figured it out by now, but it always takes so much longer than I expect. Like, every single time, though, like, I thought for sure I'd have all three videos of the series recorded before I left, but that's not the case. But the point is, the part you might care about is that I will probably mostly be doing voiceover videos for a little while while I get settled. I'm gonna be living with a lot of different people and I'm not gonna be able to bring any of my lighting equipment even though I'm really bad at lighting anyway. So there's gonna be a lot more voiceovers in my videos for a little while, but I'm just letting you know that up front. But in my next video, I'm gonna be talking about shock art and how it's infiltrated our culture, as well as why it needs defending even if people find it offensive or nonsensical. I'm also gonna be talking about the nature of transgression today and where I feel like we're headed from here. So stay tuned, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you in the next one.